Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to Reaper Pro Tips. How are you all today on this very happy Monday? At least I hope it's a happy Monday. If it's a bad Monday, then oh, but, but it's a happy Monday here. Hopefully we can make it better. Yes, hopefully we can improve your Monday. After all, that does mean more streaming. Hello, Captain Obvious, I love your name. Hello, D. Clearman. Hello, Jada, Jared, and Corniko, and Sharky. And Mistimp, and Anki, and Nomad Zeke, and Stephanie, and Numbat, and that's it. Oh, and Purple, Purple G, Geek, Purple Geekness. That's also a great name. And Lady Dire Doggo, good morning. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I hope you are all lovely this morning. We're going to do a bunch of little stuff today. Doing grand, good, grand. Hey, TB Army. Every wave. All at once. All of the waves. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm pretty good today. I'm pretty good today. Had my caffeine. Got got sleep, more or less. Good morning, Reaperites. Yes. Good morning, Reaperites. I can't do a Robin Williams. Sorry. Somebody else will have to take that. Justin's got the resonant voice, but he'd probably blow our eardrums out if he tried a good morning Vietnam. Um, oh, but I do love that line. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe if you take up voice acting, you can you can uh, wow us with your impersonations of various lines. Hello. Oh, all right. I'll Hello, let you know. <laughs> Hello, Uncle, Uncle Marker. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So this is our third day on big basing. Um, at some point in the future, I'll probably take something more like a dragon or something and show you guys like a big base that's more that's less uh, man-made stuff and probably more natural. I don't know. But for now, just on the subject of how to base your big models, um, if you don't want to do the integral whatever, uh, we are on our third day. Uh, I may put this project aside after this. I probably am going to work on a few other different things for stream uh, just because I felt like I was getting a little bit like too tied into this model and this is not the stream for that. We're supposed to switch back and forth and kind of try different stuff. And so I may put this, I'll put this lady aside a bit, I think, after this. Uh, I have a lot more putty work. Part of that is that I have a lot more putty work to do on her base, as you will see. I, uh, it's really weird to have that, you know, when you, when you're doing your job and your job is also your hobby and you're trying to work on projects that you love um, to keep your, you know, your passion alive. And then you're also doing stuff for stream. You got to have to like go, you know, and step back every once in a while. If you find that your that your models are crossing the streams. And right now this model is crossing the streams. And I, I also, I don't want to start working on painting her until I have all the base work set up, all the everything set up. Right. Cause I have to figure out like lighting and I have to figure out, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing behind her and, you know, if I'm going to do any freehand like banners or anything weird on like what's behind her, if I get anything behind her, I don't even know yet. So you guys get to see my process today. Um, so yeah, good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's go to min cam. Boop. All right. So I did a bit of a Zenith Prime on her. And as you can see, my Zenith Primes are just as splotchy as yours are. Um, also the primer was just get generally giving me uh, problems. You can avoid the splotchiness if you use something like Steinol Res. Uh, and blow it out of an airbrush instead of doing a primer can as I did. But I am lazy that way and also don't want to just set up an airbrush to prime one model. So David and I keep talking about setting up an, an airbrush uh, booth kind of on the end of our little table here because we have a table off the edge of our desks that's kind of a setup for that. Uh, so if we do that, then maybe I'll finally uh, be able to just whip out the airbrush to do something like this. Although I got a pretty good, pretty good coat on the back, as you can see. Um, I did a, a Patreon thing recently that uh, kind of showed how I work over Zenith Primer, how I smooth it out and everything. It's, it's very easy. I mean, it's just a bit of blending and uh, glazing to kind of get the, the speckles to go away. You definitely do want the speckles to go away. And you want to solidify. Like, your primer is never going to be perfect. It's never going to, um, it's never going to hit everything you wish it would hit. Uh, so like definitely the foot would get a highlight and the ankle bone there would get a highlight and all of this should be much stronger. Uh, the light obviously isn't just going to hit up here like the primer spray does. It would hit down here as well. So you've got to kind of correct for Xena. Zenith is not a, a magic bullet. It just kind of gives you an idea where your highlights should go if you're challenged to do that or if you want to have some underpainting to make the first process a little easier. So, um, with her, I wanted some dramatic overhead lighting, so I went for it. Uh, do, do, and her hand is just uh, orange tacked on. So 
I still have to elongate the uh, bottom of the staff so it hits the uh, hits the everything. This there is so much green work to do. Um, yeah, actually, this is a light gray uh, mist stamp I did. I like the um, uh, Tamiya light gray primer, uh, and I tend to use that a lot. So let's see here. So as you can see, I got some more like little splotches. I had some green work. Um, so I did some, I had some green out this weekend. So I did some more work on the uh, splotchy things and I put in uh, a chunk of masonry so that it would really uh, kind of gallop down and then kind of fade out because um, I didn't want it to just end on a big chunk. Uh, I did some more green work. I did some more ripping work so that this is more disguised now. Um, I didn't get my green potty. You can see how much green work I still have to do. I have to fill in this whole edge here, probably put a little green up underneath here. Need to figure out what I'm doing back here. There comes a stage in every big project like this where you are, where it's a good thing to put it aside for a bit. Um, because I, I really am thinking the more I do it, I kind of don't like, I mean, I know, I know you can do this because people do it and I've done it all the time. You could just paint this black, right? And, and I've, I could very much just paint this black, black and be happy with it. But then there's the temptation also to just extend a little bit of the story down here, right? Cause otherwise it's a huge space that you're not using. So at this point in this project, I know I, I might want to do something down here like that, but I haven't figured out what yet. And I need to kind of think on it. Um, you never want to just like make a snap decision if you're doing a model that you're planning to do to a very high standard and, and to, for a competition or something. It's often good just to go, well, I'm going to put it aside and don't put it out of view, like out of sight, out of mind. Put it somewhere where you can see it, where your brain can kind of percolate on it and think about it every once in a while going, oh yeah, what do I want to do there? And then maybe while you're working on another project, an idea will hit you and you'd be like, oh yeah, I want to do some carvings here or something, right? Um, and make it more interesting and maybe like tell some, use some, uh, some of the Celtic imagery here and do, do a design or something. Um, so that's where I am here. I also need to do a lot more green up here. I need to extend the green, like probably little bits of it need to go out to the edges. So that it's not just a splotch in the middle of every tile. Um, all of this work up here is meant to, uh, meant to just make the surface more irregular and organic. So that's not just flat. If I was doing a, a marble floor or something that was very closely tiled and not broken up and not rough at all, I, uh, I could have gotten away with just leaving these more or less flat. I probably still would have wanted to put a little texture on it, but I might've just taken some sandpaper or something and just, you know, roughed up, roughed it up just a tiny bit. Um, but if you're doing like a glossy, uh, marble ballroom floor and you're just tiling, your tiles go very close together, right up against each other, um, you could just leave this flat and obviously, cause then you're going to be glossing it and you're going to make it look like really, really sleek marble. So, I mean, you can vary this technique depending on, on what you're doing, but I wanted it to be a, like a cracked old craggy frost giant castle, um, up on a mountaintop that's been, you know, assaulted and ruined and all that. So I wanted that. So that is why I went for this effect and why I'm going to continue to build up green stuff on the edges, not only to thicken these tiles a little bit, but to uh, just generally make them a little more beat up, give them, let's see if I can get, yeah, you can see the, the texture that I got. You, and uh, if you go back and watch last week's um, Friday episode, you can see how I got that texture, which is really just smooshing down a thin layer of green and then using a piece of smaller cork, the edge, which is nice and crumbly and irregular, to get that kind of pitted, you know, this stone has been walked on for, you know, centuries and there are holes and bits and, you know, rained on stuff, um, things like that. Uh, just looking, looking, looking at your, your comments. Ah, I see. Well, I'm glad that, you know, that it's not worth me setting up my airbrush then. <laughs> I should just use the spray can. I guess you can get more precise with your, with your airbrush rate. Um, and, uh, so yeah, normally, by the way, I do not like black primer. Um, but on big models, sometimes I do like if, only if I'm going, if I'm going for a dramatic lighting effect, I think it helps. Uh, so I, I spent a long time like not liking black primer, but I do find, uh, for some of these big guys, especially if I want a very dramatic light that it does help. So Sergio is the one who, who turned my head around on that actually. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, I'm just, don't have an airbrush. You haven't even done. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, Chibi Army, the idea is that, okay, so so Chibi Army, when you use a black primer, it's really hard to get your colors to bring them up to where they go really light and bright. And when you use a white primer, you have to paint in your shadows, right, more, more dramatically. And sometimes you can suffer a little bit if you don't paint them in very, very dramatically uh, and you want a dramatic effect. So what this two-tone priming does is pretty much sets you up where when you put down your lighter colors or your brighter colors, you've got this lighter base. So it's going to help you do that, keep your light colors light. And it's also going to help you push your dark colors very shadowy and black because it's giving you a black base. It's like white paper versus black paper as far as what you're going over. So it's going to be easier for you to keep your light colors light and bright here. And it's also, if you don't understand like highlighting and shading, shading very well, this can help you because it helps you. It shows you, right? It shows, okay, this, this area should be in shadow. There should be a shadow here. There should be a shadow under this little braid here. You know, there should be shadows under all these things. You can see how the primer is naturally uh, lined even. It's, it's put a tiny shadow under these little leather bits and, and under here and it shows you there should be a highlight on the knee here because it's definitely picking up a bit of that. So when you have, when you're just starting out and you really want, you know, you don't really have a, an understanding yet of, of prime of highlighting and shading, doing a Zenith prime like this can help you a lot. Just remember it's not perfect. So like I, I might have only a few speckles down here on this cloth, but I can see that it should be hit by the light. So I should bring that up just as high as this is. Um, so yeah. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, okay. Well, diabetes industries. Yeah. Um, essentially, Ooh, that's a big question that really needs a, needs an answer all by itself. Um, actually I, I have a thing on my Patreon about that, but essentially what I usually do, Oh no, staff overboard. Um, what I do is I start with a glaze, a thin glaze, and then I paint my highlights over it. So, um, and I, I have a PDF actually about this, uh, currently at my Patreon in the $10 level, but just really briefly, I often use this, um, like if I'm using it for NMM as I am on another model right now, uh, I would, let me see, do I have her? Maybe I could show her. She still has her bikini on. She's safe, right? It's safe if it has its bikini on. I tend to work on models that are topless. One second. When I'm not doing Reaper models. All right. Um, so here, there. So that's what I was working on the other day. Uh, this is a creature caster model. It's the queen of ecstasy just for credit. Um, so the way you start this is you zenith it, uh, and then you paint over it with a glaze. So essentially you can see where, did you get it chewy? Yeah, you can actually, uh, take photos. That's a great, a great idea from chewy. That's, that's also something you can do, but, uh, I'm lazy and don't want photos. So, okay. So essentially I have, uh, I have some bounced highlights here so you can see where I, these lighter areas that you can kind of see the Brown, I actually put white under that. So then I glaze with this dark Brown and it takes my shadows up to from black to dark Brown. And it takes my highlights up to kind of this lighter Brown. Um, there we go. Now you can see her, you can see the highlight underneath her face. So I start like that. Um, Diomedes. Um, so, do a thin layer and cause that's the only thing. If you use thick paint diamonds, you're never going to keep your highlights. You're never going to, they're never going to be there at that point. You may as well just take a picture of the mini under a strong light source and not do Zenith priming at all. Just start with white primer and take a, take a photo under a light source and take a photo, uh, you know, take a, take a picture of it and just copy what you see. Um, but if you're going to do the Zenith, the whole point of Zenith is yeah. If you're going to utilize it, um, do a, a glaze, essentially a thin layer, like a, like a heavy wash almost over it. And then you'll see where your highlights should go and you can just highlight those right away and you can see where your shadows go and do those afterwards. So that's how I do it. Uh, <laughs> yes, my Patreon is fun. Um, it is, uh, patreon.com slash painting big. And, uh, I do do, I try to do an awful lot of stuff for new people. Um, because I, I feel like, uh, advanced painters should for one thing, because we, we came from there and it took us a long time to get to where we are. And we, you guys just see the finished product of where we are and you don't always see the journey. Um, so us teaching you and, and essentially, um, you know, sharing what we've learned and how I think is, uh, is a great thing for the hobby. I like to see it. Um, all right. So yay, there we go. We have, we have stuff. 
All right, so let's talk about some of the things that I'm actually on the got on the board here today. Um, also, uh, hmm? Diomedes, welcome to the community. Um, oh yeah, I gifted him a sub. So, ah, sweet, yay! Oh, the I have some of those dice minis, Diomedes. Maybe I should use one for a demo this week. You've reminded me that I have them. Um, I have a couple of the high rollers, and I really like them. Uh, maybe we could try a swirly pattern, like a swirly dice pattern on them. That would be probably pretty painful, but. And I don't know if I have much swirly dice. I'd probably just be a marbled effect, actually, if you're going to do that. Anyway, all right, back on topic. Boy, I am off topic like crazy today, guys. Apologies. All right, so things that we're working on for this. I was going to give a try to some texture medium, which, you know, is another option for you if you wanted to texture this, uh, but you wanted to do it fast and not use green. Because green, you know, it might give me a very realistic stone texture, but obviously it's taking me forever, right? So... There's a downside to using green stuff. Yeah, we could totally do swirly dice. Um, but uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Yeah. All right, so I've got... I've stolen my uh, my boyfriend's uh, uh, texture. Uh, Games Workshop also does little, little pots of texture goo. Um, what it all is is just like uh, sand or flock or grit or whatever mixed into an acrylic base. So it's a lot like paint with stuff in it, and you can make your own by grabbing some paint and putting stuff in it. Um, but if you feel like you want a really fine textured one and you just don't have the right um, grit for the job, by all means, you know, buy one of the pre-bottled ones. I like to use an old crappy brush for this, or in this case, I have some crappy craft brushes um, that I can utilize. But I also hmm, might want to... It depends on what I'm trying to do. Let me grab my sponge. So I've got a, a variety back, pack that you can get at Michael's of like various sponges and stuff like that. I seldom use them for anything but basing, but they are useful for basing. So let's get a sponge and let's get a flat brush and see which one is more efficient at what I'm thinking of. So, and do only use crappy brushes with texture paints just cause if it drives, dries in there, it's just gonna kill you, it's just bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just switched tropics freely, Shadow Raven. Yes, I do. Extremely freely. So what I was thinking with this texture paste is I don't want it on these upper areas. I want to do the green. I really like the texture that I'm getting there. But I might want it down in these in-between areas, in these cracks. And so I was thinking I would use, I would try to use, like, first uh, first kind of just a grab, a grab bag brush, just like, you know, kind of stipply and kind of poke it and see if I could get some stuff down into those cracks. But that's, these bristles are too, I can tell already, these bristles are too stiff. They're not really letting me dab it down into the cracks where I want. So I'm gonna rinse that one out and we're gonna go to a flat instead. There's a flat synthetic brush. And now the hope is that I can brush it across the surface and get it down the cracks that way, which I think is gonna work just fine. Let me get my glasses. Yeah, actually, yeah, you can put photos on the Discord, of course. Yes, yes. You can you can get texture any way you want. I want to experiment a little bit with this. Okay, so this is working actually really well. Using a flat brush with a nice even edge, I'm able to scrape the goo off of my upper surfaces and plant it where I want it, which is uh, essentially I'm making grout. <laughs> I'm making frost giant grout here. I'm assuming their grout is not too high tech, so uh, I'm assuming it's pretty grainy and gritty. They don't have super smooth grout. It's a terrible thing to try to clean. It may be why this castle was demolished in the first place. Who knows? So essentially, let me get up close and let me focus. Let me get up. Whoa. Giants are definitely taking offense to this grout situation. <laughs> I don't know. Do frost giants care about grout? Like storm giants would definitely care about grout, but that maybe that's why they live in the wilderness mostly, like or in cloud castles. You know, I'm pretty sure that cloud giants live in cloud castles to avoid grout, like because nothing is worse than trying to clean grout. Seriously. So here we I are. I can second that. <laughs> so here I am. I've got it. I see how it's filling in those gaps. And that's really nice because I can see how smooth it is down here. And this is giving me a much more realistic effect. Um, <laughs> you need to up, game, up your game on grout. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what are we using for the grout? Chew Boots. I am experimenting with a product that David had lying around, which is uh, AK. 
Um, it's a uh, natural texture for earth, but you could easily uh, just get, the Games Workshop does like mud and soil and stuff. I like their mud texture quite a bit. Um, we don't have Reaper texture paints yet. I'm not sure if we're ever going to do them, but you know. <laughs> they could live in cloud castles to glare down at puny mortals, Nomad Zeke, but I prefer to think that they live in cloud castles to avoid grout cleaning. I think that's far more, far more uh, amusing, and I tend to go for the amusing whenever possible. Also, you know what? It's never like a lofty ideal that drives anybody to do anything. It's purely like practicality or laziness or efficiency. Like... You could, you could probably like, like, you know, one of the cloud giants may have one day gone, you know, it'd be nice to just live up there and glare down at puny humans and the rest would be like, yeah, but that's a lot of work. But then, you know, once too many cloud giant housewives had to clean the grout, um, they probably like harangued everybody and house husbands, of course, I'm sure that uh, cloud giant society has an equal amount of both. Um, they probably harangued the rest of society into it because grout cleaning. Also, they probably like. Well, they probably don't get as much dust in their curtains or anything like that. So, hmm. It would be an interesting, like, you know, possibility. All right. Yeah, I like it. Well, that's exactly what it is, Silver Arrow. I said that even with this. The only thing that texture paint is, is just uh, grit or sand or some sort of particle matter flocking that is mixed into an acrylic base. That's all it is. You can make your own. The only reason to buy it is, in my mind, if you need a really fine one, because it can be hard to get um, a, uh, you know, a, a, a grit that's fine enough that isn't hazardous to work with. So for me, that's why the Games Workshop Mud is what I mentioned specifically, because that's their finest one. Now I am getting a little bit of texture on the top here. So if I want to just kind of utilize that, I just want to dab at it. In fact, I probably want to take my initial brush, which was kind of a stiff bristled dabby kind of brush and just kind of texture it that way to make sure I'm not leaving like brush strokes on my texture paint. Um, make it kind of, let's see if I can pick it up. There it is. Make it kind of stiply. See that? So, oh yeah, we're still, we should still have a clever, uh, clever, we should, or, uh, we should still have a, um, skeleton crew on. We've been shipping. Yeah, no, no, Z. Um, yeah, um, there's no, I don't think there's any flow improver chewy boots in this. It really is just, you don't want to add much to the acrylic base at all because uh, just looking at how it's setting up so fast, you don't want to really impinge on that. So it really is just like acrylic base or paint um, with grit in it. That's all it is. It's not fancy. So put a little texture there. So I'm kind of like, I'm liking how this is coming out. You see how it's making, um, you can see how you can see the shininess between the the tiles over here, see it? And it's so smooth and it looks unnatural. But then you come over here and suddenly my floor looks so much more realistic. I'm really liking this a lot, actually. Uh, actually, Miss Ann, uh, we are probably at this point less of a skeleton crew and more of, we're real close to full staff. Really? It's just that we're doing like a kind of around the clock working. We're oh, okay. So that we can limit the amount. Is basic, right. Yeah, so there's not that many people working at any one time, but we're working kind of around the clock, I believe. All right, great. So we didn't have to... That's great, because then we don't have to let people go. We can still keep people at their jobs. They just have to be careful. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I'm glad. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, so do we have a third shift, or is it just a first and second? No, there's definitely some people on the third shift. I think Collins is one of them, particularly. Oh, wow. Um, but he's doing stuff for Blue G. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and Collins is a night owl, I guess, then. Right. I tried I tried doing third shift once in my life and I thought it was okay, but then afterwards when I went back to a normal shift, all my friends told me I was so grouchy when I'd been on third shift. <laughs> so apparently, you know, third shift is not for me. But I admire people who can do third shift. It is a great time of the day to get work done because nobody else is awake. Yeah, I'm not not really I mean I am a night owl, but I don't know that I'd want to work at third shift to be yeah. honest use a fingertip to texture this a little bit this is a really fine grit on this uh this putty well that's good i'm glad that reaper is uh really and if it's near holiday volume that's double good that means justin and i still get paid yay right justin and actually yeah not only that but a big part and i have to absolutely thank our viewers for this because it's crucial yeah i a large part of how i still get paid is uh because we have so many subs on Twitch and because we have so many supporters and people who love the shows and the things we do. So 
the more you guys watch, the more it re reinforces that I should get a paycheck. So yes, thank you yeah. for that, guys. Well, and me too, you guys right? Are literally my yes, you too, yeah. Yeah, because when I moved out here, like the a sub for this show is a vote for this show is the way I used to put it, and it really is is when you sub, yeah, it it tells the bosses that streaming is worth it for Reaper and that Justin and I ought to keep on keeping on. And, uh, you know, all the so, other people. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, guys. You, yeah. We, we really do owe you a whole lot. We, yeah, we really do. Your enthusiasm and support are so appreciated. And that doesn't even count the, uh, you know, this stuff is cool, so I'm going to go buy an order. So we really, really appreciate that. But, you know, thank right, you for right. watching and subbing and, and giving us bits and and telling Anne that you know she's a fantastic <laughs> lying to me about my voice all those things they're all fantastic <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> yes yes thank you for all the appreciation all right so when you get extra goop you can kind of like dab it off with your finger and kind of smooth it into the crack that way we do not mind finger 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 painting here we do not look down upon it um and it'll just give us more randomized texture so because this is not fine enough to hold fingerprints, so we can get some nice rough texture built up that way. Um, there, and now we now you can't see that shiny bit on the uh, the tile. There is very little smoothness left. Um. <laughs> Taz, Taz, shh, you gotta don't don't spread that. Shh. <laughs> I love when Justin gets paid too. Yay! Hello, Threads of Fate 42. Yes, hello. Good good morning and welcome. I'm using um, Sandy Goop, uh, a.k.a. Texture Paint, to grout my uh, my tiles in a realistic manner. It's actually really fun and relaxing. Everybody should try this. <laughs> it's far more relaxing than real grout. <laughs> Although I guess real grout these days, they just make it and drop it in blocks down into the cracks, which is totally cheating. Frost giants do not have that technology. They have to do it the old-fashioned way. I actually grouted my shower like Did you? three, four, five months ago. I think it was. Wow! Look at and, you. Uh, I still, I still use. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. Um, not a lot of positive things I can say about Victor, but I learned a lot of stuff with from him. Oh like, yeah, handyman stuff. Just, yeah, yeah. Like I, I can grow out my own shower because of that man. So yeah, <laughs> and I did. And I, I, I used like a pay. It didn't, it didn't have blocks. It had like, uh, it was like the stuff that you, you basically wiped in and then wiped out. It was like a oh, wax yeah. on wax off situation. Interesting. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the little blocks of grout that you just drop in between and space perfectly space the tiles. Um, but maybe that's just like the more expensive crap that you could use. Um, and you are doing it the real old fashioned way, no doubt. There we go. There we are. Eh, eh, I'll wipe off my tile a little bit. Don't want to get my tiles too sandy and grumpy. Goop, newest reaper sculptor. <laughs> good morning, dog father. Yeah, this is a really good and chill. Hey, James, thanks for that sub. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and for paychecks and also because you're awesome. We do appreciate it. All right. I, I think... believe, by the way, we're at 12 subs. Oh, are we out of our 30 goal for the AMA? Okay. For the next AMA, yes. Sweet. Lovely. All right. I'm going to actually get some water. And usually you can do this if you need to clean up edges. You can take some water and kind of dab it on, and it'll kind of melt your uh, grout, i.e., you know, your texture paint off. Because um, I do want some of these edges to not be too gritty. I want them to be a little smooth and, and chipped, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think I did all my grout. Let me see. There's grout over there, grout there. I don't see anywhere I've missed grout. So I've successfully textured in, and you can see it in there, um, between my tiles. And actually, that, that is making everything look a lot more real, which is fantastic. Because that's what we're trying to do, right? You set up your shapes, and you don't mind that they're kind of artificial looking or, or just like lumps, right? When you're, when you're doing this for like a dinosaur or a dragon's base, you might set up, start by setting up a bunch of cork ledges or foam, foam core ledges or just heaps, right? And it looks really artificial and, and fake, but by adding the texture and filling it in the way that it would be, you can you can salvage that and suddenly it doesn't look just like you glued plastic card down to another piece of plastic card. Now it looks like, you know, it's real, real tile. And the more texture I put on the surfaces as I as I green out this stuff and get it uh 
get it to where I want it with the texture on, on the tiles themselves and doctoring the edges, um, the more real it's going to look. And so I'm very, actually very happy with the texture goo and how it's worked. Um, I would do this again for sure. And, uh, I'm going to remember how much, how much texture it puts. Cause if you need a really fine texture on a surface, this does put a really fine texture on this flat surface. Um, so I could see, I wouldn't do it here, but like if you were doing cement, for example, like if you were doing um, concrete or cement, uh, like you were doing a science fiction mini and you're doing a street scene and you have to do a curb or something, this is fine enough that I think it could give you that good pebbly rough texture for cement, just enough texture to make it, you know, not be boring, right? To not, because you just don't want it to be super flat. You need it to be flat because it's, it's a, if it's a modern setting, of course, it's all graded and it's going to be very, very uniform. Uh, but you'd need some texture on the, on the cement. So this would be actually a good product for this, this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so there we go. So we experimented successfully with our goop. Now, the only thing with goop is don't leave the goop open too long. And you probably want to add a couple of drops. Actually, I'll do this right now. You probably want to add a couple drops of water to your goop if you've been like I did and just left it open for a bit, just so that your goop doesn't dry out. So I'm going to actually mix that into the top layer here to keep it just a couple drops. So it didn't really affect the texture of the goop. It's just going to uh, keep it wet for longer so that your goop doesn't dry out. Don't want your goop to dry out. It's a bad idea. All right, there we go. And now we screw it back on really nice and tight so it doesn't dry out. And yeah, so that was AKA Terrain's uh, Natural Texture for Earth. So I would have to say, yeah, this stuff pretty useful, especially if you're doing big, like big science fiction dioramas, I could see, or backdrops. Um, really, really quite useful. And I gotta make sure, yeah, I've got a couple of brush strokes, but I'm gonna put down some green stuff over here too. So I'll just have to make sure I don't leave any regular texture from my grouting. Um, all right, so let's show you guys um, how I intend to make some icicles. Let's see here. So what I wanted to do was make this as if it's a ruined crumbling edge of what used to be a room in a palace and that uh, my giantess was sitting, standing on the edge, brooding, staring down at the villagers below or whoever trashed her place. Probably villagers where an adventuring party came from, right? Um, so that's what I was thinking I wanted. And, uh, because it's obviously exposed to the elements, I wanted to hang some icicles and melt from this and do some snowy stuff. Um, so I have a thing where I, I figured out a long time ago, kind of how to do icicles and they worked really well. So, uh, they're also pretty durable and they stay good for a long time. So it's going to be obvious, but I don't, yet I don't see people do this, but you can do this with a little woodland scenic water effects. It is uh, very easy. Um, maybe not to do tiny icicles. That would take some work probably with a toothpick or a sculpting tool, but it is possible. But so this stuff is stiff. Um, the Woodland Scenics water effects in, this is a very old bottle. So hopefully it still works. Uh, but, uh, it's white goopy, white goop. Let me see. Let me see what we got. Yeah. Yeah. White goop. Okay. Mine is a little bit old. So I'm going to shake it, I'm gonna shake it up a little bit here before I do it out. Yes. Yes. Um, Janky, I used to do a lot of scenic bases. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, oh, and yeah, Pendrake. Um, the green is green stuff. If you watch Fridays, you can see me do it. Um, but since I'm doing green around the edges, uh, to make these look like thicker tiles instead of like two layers of plastic card, like you can see here. Um, so I'm also doing a thin layer of green that I can texture. You can see the texture here. It's a really nice, like worn stone texture in thin layers. So, and I'm texturing it using a bit, a bit of cork. Um, so not the big heavy cork that I'm using for the base, but the little finer, finer cork. Um, but yeah, I use, uh, Woodland Scenics water effects for icicles. I think they make, it makes fantastic icicles. All you need is a piece of plastic card or plastic, um, blister plastic. I use a lot and, uh, it comes with a pretty fine nozzle. So... Oh boy. I haven't done any real dioramas actually, Jenky. I did, um, a Viking with dog scene for one of my exes and, uh, it was a real, it was a riverbed, a frozen riverbed. It had, it was actually the first time I used these icicles. Um, let's see, where's a tissue to make sure that sometimes you get a little bit of fluid in the top of this. So you want to squeeze it out, squeeze it out till you see all white. When you see that white paste, that's what you want. Sometimes when it's older, this stuff separates. 
But yeah, normally I don't do I don't do a big diorama. Like I don't I haven't done any dioramas for Reaper. Um I think the closest thing is the integral like Master Series miniatures um Undead Hunter Jonas Kane, I think. I don't remember. Okay, so let's see. This is still giving me fluids, so come here. Kleenex. Come on, water effects work. Ah, there we go. All right, so what you want to do is you want to draw a thin line that's kind of wobbly, just like an icicle. You squeeze a bit out to start it, and then you're kind of dabbing it, and you want it to be thin. So it should look like an icicle. And you can do various sizes, and it doesn't matter if, you, if you're a bit gloopy, you're okay, because you just take a sculpting tool, and you can shape this stuff before it dries. So you can take a sculpting tool with an edge. You can kind of wipe it off or elongate it. You can kind of pull this stuff down. You want it to be kind of clumpy because remember icicles are, are irregular as they uh, set. And you, you're going to have some icicles that don't look as good. So just get used to that. But this first icicle is pretty good. So I can actually kind of pull out him a little longer. And push in his uh, any little irregularities that it has that I don't want. And get over and let's tune this guy up. I'm just using a spoon, little spoon tool, but you could use any edged sculpting tool to kind of dress up your icicle and make it a little bit better shaped. And obviously with icicles, you don't have to be perfect. I'm just doing individual ones at the moment. And if you want, if you've got too much uh, extra goo there, you can take the edge of a Kleenex. You might want to actually wrap it around your little sculpting tool. I need a, I need a new Kleenex here. Yeah, there we go. And then, ah, you can use your sculpting tool to kind of press, press the edge of the Kleenex up and just kind of take, wipe off that extra so you get a cleaner edge. So icicles, yay, icicles. So now these will dry. They will be lumpy on one side and flat on the other side. If you are using them to overhang on a base like this, you could just put the flat side toward the interior and probably nobody would notice. But if you wanted to, after they're dry, you can peel them off and put another layer on the other side to round them out. Um, if you want to see how they turn out, it takes about two days, depending on how thick they are, if you do a really thin icicle, I have I have an old icicle here for you to see. Um, it is so old, like this thing is probably a good 15 years old. I actually just discovered I had a little jar of icicles from ages ago, the last time I did this. But as you can see, when it dries, it looks like ice. It looks like an icicle. So... Um, Janky, that would be, my best memory would be when I won, won my first national award. None of my friends believed I could do it. I drove from Madison to Baltimore, um, to enter Golden Demon, which was Games Workshop's national painting awards. Um, and, uh, and yeah, none of my friends back in my, the house I was living in believed I could do it. And, uh, I walked in there and I walked out with a silver golden demon trophy. Um, and the first thing I did was call my friend back at home and go, yeah, I won. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was one of my best awards, uh, my best moments. Cause that was like, that was my first national win. Um, where I was competing against some of the best painters in all of the U S and some Canadians, uh, who had come down to win. That was Baltimore 2002. And I got my trophies were handed to me by um, the Perry twins, who are two of the most famous sculptors who worked for Games Workshop in those days. Uh, so I actually got my Golden Demon handed to me by them. And I really admired them. So that was awesome. Uh, all right. So, yes, little tiny icicle. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, da 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 da. Yeah, yeah, a little tiny, uh, actually there are here, another thing you could do, yeah, is use one of these things. I don't know, it's kind of fluffy, so you might have to be careful with it. Um, this is, I use these for texturing sometimes, but, uh, but yeah, but so tiny icicle, actual tiny icicle, and the nice thing is that once they're dry and you, and you pull them off, you can cut off the edge, you can see the end is, uh, is flat. So you can use a hobby knife or a really sharp scissors to cut the end so that it's flat so that you can glue it to things better. 
And then, yeah, you just pretty much can, if you want, you can use some of the, um, the Woodland Scenics to kind of dab and make kind of a layer of ice first and then uh, poke your icicles up into that and let it set and you will have tiny, tiny icicles hanging from your base. And of course, this underlay, this overhanging uh, tile stuff is great too if you have room to hang an icicle um, off of that. But yeah, you can pretty much hang icicles. And if you want, you can do um, a set of icicles. So, you know, you don't have to do them individually. I like to do them individually because it gives me, you know, a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. But you could also do the whole, um, do a line of stuff and then do a series of icicles hanging down off of the stuff. And you get better at it. And then you could do just little bits, right? You can do like a little tiny little drip of icicle. And then you can do this and say you're going to end on a nice big fat one like so. Yeah, so you can do that. And once it dries, uh, you can totally like just peel it off. Like just be a little gentle when you peel it off. And you might want to use a, a, a knife or a sculpting tool to kind of gently, gently press up and pull it off. But in general, I mean, it might elongate a little bit whether it's where it's really thin but this is uh, generally, they're very versatile and they're very durable. They'll stretch a bit before they break. So, so yeah, so you can make some, as you can see, some really cool melting ice effects that you can just stick onto things. Um, and for the very thick parts, like for this guy, I would say like this top one, you'll see it go transparent in the thin part first and then it'll still be milky white, but don't worry, just give it another day and it'll go totally transparent. Um, it's nice that it's not totally transparent at first because then you can judge the shape really well. All right. Um, Silver Arrow, if you're a new painter, also, if you think that you could use a, a brush up on techniques, then I'd say the two learn to paint kits that we put out are the best bang for your book. Buck, you get miniatures to practice on, brushes, a great instruction manual, and between the two of them, you get a good selection of paint. If you already know, like you're painting, if you already have painting shops and you don't think you need a refresher on technique, then I would say we have a starter set that's 11 colors. That's a good selection. And that also would be a good thing to start with. But as far as just pure bang for your buck, the seriously, the learn to paint kits are great because we discount the learn to paint kits substantially. So you are getting a large discount. Whereas with paint sets, you're not always getting a very large discount. So. Uh, yep, you could do an ice monster maw. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that you could do, right? So it's uh, it's very versatile stuff, the water, the water effects. I honestly don't know why more people don't use this for this sort of thing for ice effects. I've, I've done it, uh, I've done it to use, to make like little flying droplets and stuff and things like that. It's just, there's so many ways to use this stuff. I always keep a bottle of it around and my bottle has lasted me for like seriously 15 years now. So that, that thing is that old, um, and it still works. So there you go. Yeah. Oh, what was that? Taz Lynch? Oh, about the Corona holder. Yeah, so may that maybe they haven't. Uh, maybe they haven't. Uh, if if they didn't answer it, yeah. If it wasn't acknowledged, then they didn't have an answer for you. Like, how easy is this stuff to paint over? Ah, uh, you know, I haven't tried, Taz. I uh, if you wanted to, or uh, if you wanted to. Ah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could try it on my one icicle. I would guess that it repels water pretty well. So, I mean, the, the whole point of it is to be translucent, right? But you could probably use, like, Tamiya Clears, uh, since they're a little bit different of a, uh, a little bit different of a paint base. But I'd imagine, I could, I could be wrong, though. We could try a glaze of something over this. Hold on, let me grab a clear bright. It's a good thing I always have clear brights close to hand. And I always have a palette somewhere around here. Demon Aqua, let's see how we can paint over this sucker. Let's put a little bit of clear blue into a palette. And first I'll try using it full strength. Although this is actually a little bit thinned. Does it paint? Ah! Well, it, um, it definitely, it does have painted here to it, actually. 
it went blue there. It went a little bit blue. And the paint didn't beat up. So, stay. Yeah, so you can tint it with clear brights. Um, you can see how it's gone slightly blue. You don't want to do a lot because obviously you're trying to, I assume you're trying to keep some transparency to it. Otherwise, why bother? Um, I would not mix color into it, Twisted Oma. I don't know if it'll cure if you do. If you want to experiment with that and see if you can, go for it. But I, uh, I always use it for very clear effects. So the most I would do is probably what I just did is use some clear bright, glaze it over the top. Yeah, so there we go. Oh, and Valandar, thank you for the resub. Awesome. Yeah, Andre Kratt, there's what I just said is I don't think... Oh, there you go. So there you go. Seth and Eno is Woodland Scenic Cells coloring to go in it. So that's probably a dye. Because, yeah, the problem is that, yeah, any any chemical thing that you add to this is going to disrupt how it functions. So if Woodland Scenic Cells dies for it, then that would be what you want to go with. Oh, for this stuff? Yeah, not not great for a really large or deep project. Same with the uh, realistic water. You have to build up so many layers of it. You really want to use a two-part resin um, for deep water effects like um, like David did with his mermaid for Crystal Brush. Uh, that and so many other people do a pouring a pouring resin that will go in and, and cure in a big block. And that stuff is fiddly to work with. So assume you're going to mess up your first two or three tries. I admire people who do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the icicles are in front of a light source, I guess that you could, but it would be, I mean, at that point, you almost just want to use an LED, <laughs> make a real light source. Um, but yeah, you guys ask me all these questions. I honestly just use this stuff for icicles and water effects. I do not color it. I do not play with it that way. I've never really wanted, when I want to use it, I want to use it clear to look like real water. Um, so experiment. Do your own, do your own little experiments, play around with it, see what you can do. Um, obviously you can paint over it without completely losing the clearness. So, um, it starts to cure. I think, I think you'd have at least an hour or two, but James, honestly, you'll end up shaping it. Like, uh, I mean, it won't take you more than a half an hour probably to shape it into like licks of flame. Um, that you like and it certainly will be still wet at that point I normally have to let it cure overnight and even then the first part is uh, the thinnest part is the only part that's cured at that point so like at this point where I where I stretched it really thin on the card and wiped it mostly off and it's already solid but but otherwise it's going to take uh, hours probably to set completely it might skin over I'm not sure um, but yeah so you could do that so yeah, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting medium. Play with it. Show us what you can do with it. Now that I have exposed you to it, you too can grab water effects and go crazy with them. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Icicles, icicles, icicles. What time is it? Oh yeah, we got a little time left. All right, so let's talk about vertical composition. That was my last point that I wanted to grab today. Let me go and get my palette out of the way here and make sure that it doesn't have paint dry in it so I can clean it afterwards. But yeah, um, mess around with it, guys. The, just remember, the thicker that you put the with the um, water effects on, the longer days, maybe, it will take to set. So it can take a long time. I'm going to remove some of my weird brushes here since I'm not using them. Get it back in your holder, weird brushes. Yeah, then we'll go in the weird brush home. I'm glad that I ha I've got so many drawers like right next to me in my new setup. And even though it feels a little crowded, it's great because everything is arm's reach away. <laughs> uh, how long would an average miniature take me to paint? Jenki, uh, my stuff for Reaper, when I was doing stuff for the Reaper gallery, usually between 8 to 12 hours, depending on the complexity of the figure. More for bigger figures. That's just a human size figure. Um... And uh, that was probably, that's definitely a level below my competition work level. All, all miniature painters are going to give you kind of a, a set of levels that they paint to. Like, obviously, if I'm painting for gaming models, I can go much faster and much simpler. 
but if I'm uh, painting for a gallery, it's going to be the next level. And if I'm painting for competition, then it's going to be an even higher level. So I would say for a gaming paint job between two and five hours, depending on how much I like the figure and how big it is. Um, with uh, gallery work, I would say eight to 12, eight, up to 15 if it's a really complicated model with a lot of parts. Um, and then more for monsters. Uh, or for bigger figures like 54 millimeter or 72 millimeter. Uh, but then for competition, my first competition model that I won the Golden Demon with was uh, 40 hours. So that gives you an idea how quality scales up with time. Um, I once tried to paint a dragon for competition and I stopped at 120 hours and it wasn't quite done. So, you know, uh, Soldier, my big... Uh, 12 inch tall soldier 76 overwatch statue that I painted for Reaper a few years ago it took me 140 hours. So when you're starting to deal with where you want it to be as close to perfect as you can get it, or you're dealing with a very large model, the time involved really shoots up. So do, do, do. Hey, freestyle. Thanks for the sub. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What Miss Dim said, tabletop display or competition. There is, there's three levels for the most painters. And if you ever go to hire a um a painting service to paint models for you you will get prices scaled on those levels for the most part uh, all right so vertical composition when i put this model on her base it's great it's scenic and all that you know i did some stuff and she fits on it and here let's let's raise the camera up so we can get a better a better look at her with her base and also let's get in ah, ah, ah. all right let's get in focus there we go. Much better. And now focus. All right, there we go. So she's cool and all, and I at least have a sense of place starting here where I've got her standing on this base and the base is cool. It's got nice shapes. She fits on it well, as you can see. Um, but there's no backdrop or anything back here. Like I've got this nice square base and uh, when she's on it, she only takes up like half of it because I want her looming to the front. So I originally did want to do something else behind her. So verticality is now the name of the game because obviously if I do something little, it's not really going to show up unless I turn it around. So if I do something low down here, um, well, Chibi Army, don't worry, you can go back. <laughs> That's the great thing about Twitch VODs and YouTube. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, so if I do something low to the ground, then it's only going to show up from the back. The advantage of doing something low to the ground back here for detail is that if I do some fancy freehand or something on her cape, you're still going to be able to see it from there, right? You're, you're, if, you, if I've got, if I do this like water basin, if I do a fountain or something and have it drooling down the back here of the piece, which actually I have considered, um, then I can still do some fancy freehand on her cape and you're going to be able to see it. Whereas if I do a wall here, then any fancy freehand on her cape is going to be somewhat wasted. So these are the pluses and minuses and the things you want to weigh when you think about putting a backdrop on a figure. It's like probably the best figures for backdrops and to put in a diorama with a wall behind them or whatever are going to be the figures that are kind of boring on the backside. But if you're going to do anything, you know, cool, then if you put a big wall here, you're not going to see it. So if I'm going to do anything, I probably need to only do a partial wall or I need to do something that's very low. Um, and so I started just, uh, and I, I actually messed around with a bunch of materials last night. You can build shapes just to kind of try them out with a various mediums. Um, I thought about using Sculpey. I thought about using modeling clay and just kind of mocking something together. Um, I thought about shape, shapes out of paper or plastic card. You can use all of that. Uh, it all, it, whatever works for your process, really, to imagine how you can do stuff. But for me, I realized that if I'm going to do this, um, I'm probably going to do it with cork because I want blocks and I don't have her starts, um, nor do I really want to use her starts because they're so heavy and I don't want to overbalance one part of the base. Uh, although her starts would be the easiest way to do this. Um, so I decided I would use cork and I would just cut it into rough blocks because I'm probably going to do green stuff over it anyway, just like I did down here. And then I can build up, say, part of a wall. And I thought about an archway, um, kind of like she's got a ruined wall on this side of her and a doorway, a ruined doorway on the other side. So I could build up an arch like there and get some dynamic um, shapes. And why would I want to do that? Because this is cool and all, but it is a little bit boring. Like, it's just a block. 
It's a nicely textured block with some nice scenery on it, but it's still just a block with the mini on top. And if I put something up behind her, I can introduce different shapes that would make this whole thing maybe look more interesting. Um, I could add more verticality to it so it's more imposing, it catches the eye. Um, you know, just a bit of visual interest from the rear. I could add part of a wall or a fountain or whatever and give you something to look at back here besides my awesome paintwork or my soon to be awesome paintwork, I should say. Right now it's my crappy Zenithal. Um, so that's why you would do a backdrop. Another reason to do something behind the model is if you are doing a lighting effect. Um, often when you are doing a lighting effect and you're just like, like if I was going to make the dragon head up here glow, I could pull it off probably. It would glow, the glow would hit the lower part of the staff, it would hit her hand, it would hit her face and all of this. But the glow would be even better if she had a wall behind her that the glow was casting, you know, a, a glow on so that you could see a radiating glow around the area. That's going to actually make the model, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the glow look more realistic. So I often tell people that that really fancy OSL um, if you've, if you've got an, an item that's being held out away from the model that you want to glow, sometimes the best thing you can do is have a backdrop, uh, because that's going to, you you know, it's going to be evident then you can visually show that the item is glowing that way. Downside is only really looks right. Sometimes from some angles, sometimes it can be a little bit off depending on how far back the wall is. So you really want to do it something up close if you're going to be doing that. Um, Uh, Pendrake, I don't really care because <laughs> you know what? I'm going to green it in anyway. So for me, I am less concerned about uh, historical verisimilitude and more concerned about what do I want to do and what's going to look good. Um, but yeah, I chose to put the flagstones down because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So if I want these to be cut off, then I'm just going to have to putty around it and just make it look like the wall was built up. Um, also, these are frost giants. We don't know who built this castle. They could have been really shoddy engineers. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, if you were doing a historical model, however, you should worry about that sort of thing. So that's good to know. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know about the fountain. It depends on if I can find a good bowl shaped um, something to use for it as a start. I really don't want to sculpt a fountain all myself. This is where you get into the, I have a cool concept, but do I really have the oomph to do it, right? Am I, do I really want to spend all this time creating, you know, sculpting from scratch something uh, that, you know, that I could make work that way. Uh, I actually did do that for a model. I did sculpt a, a wine cup for a model, like a big one um, for a for a big bust. It was not fun. <laughs> it took a lot of time to get it to be a kind of a regular shape. I used Sculpey for it. Um, but yeah, so you kind of have to, yeah, the art attract, yeah. Well, no, 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 go ahead, Pendrake. I mean, that's a useful piece of information for people who are listening and who do want to do historical models. And now I'm going to remember that if I do do a historical diorama, right? I, you just gave me a very useful piece of information. Um, but for this, I, I want to, I would, I do want to emphasize, don't overthink it sometimes. Um, like if you, if you do make the mistake of laying down a bunch of tiles and you do want to put a wall on top of them, don't worry about it too much. I mean, maybe if one of your judges is an architect, they're going to yell at you, but then you can say, yeah, but goblins built this castle and the giants only moved in later. And that's why they're unhappy because it was way too small and they had to knock down walls. <laughs> and then the grout, man, the grout was just terrible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's okay. No, but yeah, seriously, Pendrake, your, your suggestion is very useful. Um, because if I was doing a World War II diorama, now I would know that I needed to think about that. Right. Whereas I am only an artist and, you know, writer and dog trainer sometimes. And, uh, this dog is trained to sleep during my, my streams very well. Um, but yeah, so that. So let's do some vertical construction real quick. Let's see, what do we got? Uh, we've had about an hour. I'll just try to cut out some bricks and uh, we can see, we can kind of look at how high we want it to go. I don't want to be, I don't need to be like real persnickety on matching these up. I just have to be roughly in line. I can always adjust with green stuff or putty later on. Um, it, uh, it does help if you've got, like if I had basswood, of this consistency, that would be the best building material for this, in my opinion. Um, but unfortunately, my basswood is all tiny, cause 
28 millimeter miniatures. Um, so I don't really have anything that's really good. There are a lot of materials that would be equally as good or better for this than cork. Cork is very crumbly. It does give me the ruined block effect though. So if I'm going for that, then great. It is going to, however, crumble and drop pieces all over the place. So I won't necessarily get great uh, uniform blocks off of it. I think Sculpey would be a great thing to do. The, my problem with Sculpey is just texturing it to make it look like rock can be difficult. It tends to look like a toy um, when I've done it before. I'm a little better at it now, so maybe it wouldn't be quite so bad. So I'm just cutting it with a knife, cutting into my little pad. Oh, it's not cutting very easily though. I must have a very tough piece of cork here. Or I can just break it and use that as the ruined edge. Yeah, sometimes it's just not worth it. So we can build up our layers of cork. I'm gonna do another one right here. Let's cut this one down the middle. I want them to be different thicknesses. I want this to be a very ragged castle. Um, if I need to worry about flat edges, then I'm going to have to trim some stuff. But if I'm doing a ruined something or other, we're pretty good. So I like to place them kind of kitty corner if I'm doing ruined blocks. And I probably will want to do some grout. Oh, no. Um, between <laughs> these blocks, um, when I'm greening them, I'm going to need to make uh, gaps. So let's see here. Let me see if I can get this to where it's seeable without focusing on the background. All right. So I probably would set these off off angle with from each other and I would leave a little space between them. But for right now, I just want to see how high I can build it and do I like it. So I'm just kind of grabbing little blocks and building little architecture and I'm just gonna pile it up. Yeah. Yeah, basswood is like balsa, but it's yeah, it's got it's more firm. So you can do um yeah, backstory for the win. Uh, I already mentioned that Pendrake actually building down the side of the wood block instead. I could just do that. But this, if I'm using cork, it's way too fragile. Um, so I wouldn't do that probably. This is going to be something I'm going to have to coat with uh, a lot of glue to make sure it doesn't crumble. And I got glue. So now I have, I finally have um, PV, PVA glue. So yay. Um, if I was going to do, if I was going to build down the side of here, I would almost need to do plastic card or or balsa or basswood or something um, that would be, you know, more sturdy, I think. Um, I feel uneasy trying to build down the side with this, except for like a crumbling area. I don't care if this crumbles further because it's already crumbling stone and I'm also going to load it with paint and everything. I don't know. I just don't like that idea. I also... Um, I don't really want, if I'm going to do anything back here, I don't want it to be thick. Uh, I don't want to make my base wider. Um, the reason is it compositional, actually. Uh, here, I've got it kind of off balance. The more off balance your base is and the less symmetrical it is, the, the more uh, exciting visually it is. So this works for me pretty well. Um, but the wider I make the base here and the smaller the figure is on top of it, that's a big compositional problem. You really need to make sure that your base is not too big for your figure and that you don't have a lot of negative space, which is why when I chose to do it this way, I, I really um, stuck myself with having to sculpt something back here. Some, I have to put something interesting back here that enhances the story because otherwise this base is way too big for the model. Um, the other way I could have done this is I could have taken a Dremel and chunked out pieces of this base and created an irregular area that way, um, as long as it was still stable, to get the same sort of effect. And then she would have like sat back farther and I wouldn't have to worry about this. Uh, but since I chose to go with this direction, that means I got to put something back here. Um, you never want your base to be too wide for the figure. She's pretty good right now because her cloak flares out really a lot. If I didn't want to put her up so far, I could get away with this base. You can see if I have equal amounts of room front and front and left, but then I've got this space and it's not doing anything. Um, you always want to, you always want to do something with your space on a base. You never want to have, I talked about this briefly, I think back on the first uh, of this series, you never want to have dead space that's not doing anything. If you're going to do a base and it's going to be a story base, everything has to like function. You don't want a space that's kind of a big space that's just sitting there. 
So if there was something, if she had a little pet who was kind of peering over the edge, that would be something good that you could put there if you wanted to put her farther back. Um, but if I want her really looming, which is kind of what I really wanted, then I need something in the back. Uh, because otherwise this is doing nothing. It's just sitting there. It's a bad composition. Uh, you don't want any part of your model to be boring. You want everything to contribute to the story. Um, yeah, actually, D. Clearman, uh, I like to say, and I'm, I'm actually going off of it a little bit, although it's pretty much in line. So what I tend to say is the base should be no more than half the height of the model. There are exceptions if you go very tall and narrow. Um, some models just lend themselves to a vertical composition. If you measure from the top of the block, I'm in violation. But if you measure from the top of the detail, I'm about right. Um, so if I line her bottom of her base up with the bottom of this uh, rock projection, uh, and then I measure up, she's the base is about as half of her height. Um, and that's that's my basic. And as far as the width goes, I really feel like the base shouldn't shouldn't be wider than half again. But even there, I'm just like, eh, it really, the width really varies. Width of the base really varies. Um, you don't want to make it too wide because you don't want to make it really, really boring. A big flat base sitting around with one model on it is really boring uh, visually. It has no excitement. It is just kind of there. Um, it's kind of like comparing, if you look out at a meadow, you feel relaxed. But if you look at a, like a rocky, you know, landscape, then it's more visually interesting and it engages you. You start looking for shapes in it and stuff. Um, that's what a base does too. If you're going to do a big flat base, put stuff in it to make it more interesting. But yeah, um, so height on this one, obviously the wood blocks, unless you're willing to get out your saw and, and saw them off, um, they kind of limit you these big squares, but, uh, that's why it's important to kind of have a bunch of bases so that you can throw the mini on top of all of them and, and judge whether, uh, it's the right size for your model, whether it looks good. This one is only a little bit wider than her. So I feel like it's a good stability point for telling a story, but it's not too boring. It's not too wide because she comes, her, her flaring cloak comes very close to the edges. So I feel like this is a good base size for her. Um, so yeah. Uh, how about you have a mini before you would consider? I always would pin Brenner. Always, always, always. Um, whenever you're, especially when you're doing a base like this, where it's plastic hard and wood, it's so easy to pin. Yeah. That pinning is a no brainer. Um, this definitely gets a pin or two, uh, and probably gets a little green stuff also, uh, eventually. Um, but, uh, even for a 28 mil, I would pin it. If you're, if you don't pin it, you're just asking for it to get knocked against something and break off. Uh, pinning is going to give your model so much more, a, you know, of a stable footing on whatever base you are. The only thing where you get into trouble with it is, uh, we were talking about this last on Friday, was if you want to use actual stone for your base and then you'd better have like a set of water drills and, and know, you know, know how to safely do that. But uh, especially with that, with stone, unless you're using really heavy two-part epoxy, it's hard to stick a model on there and have it stay. And it's really hard to use a two-part epoxy neatly uh, in that case. So that's why I don't advocate using actual rocks for bases. Uh, but yeah, but if in doubt, Mistimp is absolutely, absolutely correct. When in doubt, pin. I mean, it takes you all of five minutes and it's going to hold your model on the base so much better so that if it gets kind of knocked or, or anybody kind of brushes it, it's not going to just break off like it can. Um, so yeah, so I'll definitely be pinning her to the base. This one is a no brainer because she is just, you know, it's, this stuff is so easy to drill through. This is another reason I like, I like plastic hard cork and this, and this sort of wood base. All right. Uh, so verticality. Let's put this on here. Let's, I really can't, the only problem with cork is they can't really blue tack it. Uh, we got our opening block, got another block, we got a block and a block and a block. So I can kind of put her up here and I can kind of tilt her and see if I can even see the blocks. Let's see blocks. So those, I'm going to have to have at least eight. If I'm going to go up and do this, I'm going to need a lot of blocks, um, to make it look like that. I might, at that point, it might not be worth it for me to use cork. I might have to use Sculpey. Um, Sculpey's just going to let me, Sculpey or Fimo is just going to let me build this a lot faster, at least the basic form. And I would just have to work on, uh, texturing it and making it, making it, uh, the, the shapes regular. Um, if you do have her starts molds, you could start with her starts bricks, or you could, uh, 
even like use them as press molds for things. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, if you're doing floating, yeah, what they say, wire, acrylic rod, or magnetic levitation. Yeah. Um, I tend to like to, yeah. I mean, if you're going to do that, you almost want to have a piece of backdrop or something that you can pin straight out so that it looks like it's floating next to her or something like that. Um, or if you're going to make her floating, then something behind her, you could, you could cleverly have her kind of brushing the edge of it and have the pin go in there. Things like that. Uh, you have to play at that point with kind of optical illusion, uh, unless you're just going to use clear rod, but I find it more clever often to utilize, uh, angles with the masonry or uh, basing where you can pin in without it being obvious with a very small contact point especially with a resin model or something or plastic or something it's very lightweight you can get away with a lot that way oh uh, yeah and you can hide it with vegetation or anything else right exactly all righty <laughs> Levitated, yeah, maglev, levitated Millennium Falcon. Yeah, people who have physics as their friend, they can do all sorts of stuff. All right, my doggie is getting restless, so probably she needs to go out. So I am going to probably call it there. I'll have to work more on my uh, my options for the back of the base. I've gotten it all gritty with cork grit, but it's stone, so I don't really care about that. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of my thought process. That's how I start to think. The other thing I could do is use like this cork. Like I could I could see that if I did this, this might be the height that I would need. Like so that's where I said like paper cutouts can actually work for you. If you cut out the silhouette, like I could use if it was this height. Let's see if you guys can see this. So if it was this height, this is about the right height for an arch behind her, like a little bit taller, but this is how tall I would have to build it to make it work visually. Because if I wanted it as a backdrop for her, I need it to be a backdrop. So if I was gonna use this, you know, something like this, I might draw a little template, do a little scalloped, you know, door, half doorway, uh, and then see what I could do. So this would be like an option to just kind of judge how tall I need it to be. Although I think it's too thin and too, like I would have to blanket this with plastic card. And that's an option, like not foam core because foam core warps. But if you did foam core and you uh, did plastic card on both sides of it, or you use thin cork like this and did plastic card on both sides of it, you would still have to putty a lot like I, I'm doing on the base here. But it might be an option to get you a nice thin arch to go right behind her. Um, so yeah, I'm still thinking. I'm still thinking about story. That's why we'll probably uh, we'll probably leave her for a couple weeks while I'm kind of thinking. There's no deadline on her, so uh, since I'm doing it for me, so I can kind of sit and ruminate on what I really want to do for that archway or for a fountain or for both, um, and see what see what uh, what might work, right? So yeah, it's a lot of brainstorming. It's a lot of kind of building as you go. For me, I like to, sometimes I come in with a, with a really complete idea on a base and sometimes, and in that case, I just grab cork and start building usually, um, or, or putty or, or a uh, Fimo. But uh, more often I'm like, well, I think I kind of want this, but I won't know until I actually have it partially built and I put the figure on it and I see what fits. Right. So that's the case with her is like, I want to make a really super cool back base, but I don't have quite the right idea yet. So I'm going to have to think about it for a while. Yeah, I don't blast shadow. I mean, it's a negative, it's a negative space kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, not really into that one. Pendrake. I really wanted more like her standing in the ruins of her home, like vowing vengeance. That's really what I'm after for this ambient, um, for the story for her. So, cause she's definitely brooding as she's looking down from her little pinnacle in her, uh, her ruined palace. Um, so I have some ideas. I have some other ideas also that I'm thinking about doing, but yeah, Blast Silhouette could be cool. I've seen it done, um, in historicals before, kind of, um, for World War II stuff, I've seen the kind of the ash silhouette thing uh, done on walls, and it can be creepy. So it's it's an interesting thought, but I think I think I'm going a different direction. I'm glad you guys thought this was interesting. Yeah, yes, the castle around her is wrecked, and she is now annoyed. Yes, yes, exactly. So 
so that's where I'm at. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, we did learn a lot of different things today and I got to talk about a lot of different stuff and tomorrow we'll probably go back to some painting. Um, if I don't work on plaid on her, I'll uh, grab a different model and show you guys plaid uh, at some point. I know I had mentioned I was thinking about it for her and I'm still thinking about it, but I'm not set on it. Since she's going to be a model for me, I don't want to go ahead and half, half, half ass paint part of her. I want to do her well. So I'm not going to use her for a demo for that. Uh, but yeah, do we have a, uh, do we have somebody to raid, Justin? Yes, actually, I think we do. Who are we raiding? I think I'm going to be raiding AMP Services. Really? They're painting a GW model right now. It looks pretty good. Oh, really? Okay, cool. So new, a new person. That's really awesome. All right, so cool. Have a great day, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow. Remember that later today, Josh is on with um, his uh, his show at 3 p.m. Central Time. Right, Justin? That's correct? Yep. yep. All righty. Miniature Monday. Miniature so. Monday at 3. And otherwise, I hope you all have a great day and stick around for the raid and, and uh, pass on the Reaper love. A lot of this Games Workshop guys don't know Reaper very well or at all. So uh, represent. Be awesome. Yep. Spread the Reaper love, guys. Thank you very Super. much. Super. Have a good one. See you guys later.